Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for coming. We were so excited to um, get so much interest from alumni from across the campus, not just engineering alumni, although we've got plenty of those too, which is great, and current students. Um, uh, this is the third and final um, Ignite Innovation event of this academic year. We just started this event series uh, this year. Uh, we were talking about doing an event series anyway, and then COVID happened and we thought, well, no time like the present. Um, and Ignite Innovation is designed to showcase uh, the way our alumni and other community members use their entrepreneurial spirit and technology to come together. And today's event, I think, is certainly going to show you a very creative and exciting way that that's been happening over the past 10 years. Um, we are so excited to have our 2006 uh, electrical engineering alum, uh, Baxter Box, and his wife, Amber Vensbox, both of them business partners and founders of rewardstyle.com, which they're going to tell you about in a minute. Um, I'm going to hand it over to the Dean in, uh, in just a second to introduce them. Um, please keep yourselves muted and put any questions that you have in the uh, chat. Also for current students, um, we'll be putting a Google form link into the chat so you can fill out your information if you want to get CRP points. Um, that's it for me. I'm going to hand it over to Dean Roberts to do the introduction. So Dean, take it away. unmute myself. Am I muted? Can you hear me? I think I'm unmuted. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm excited today. Um, even though we're still in a difficult COVID time, we've had some challenges. We've all had some challenges with COVID, but it's great to get together, even if it's in a Zoom format, to have this third and final Ignite Innovation event of this year. Um, we, we designed the Ignite Innovation Series um, only a year ago, and we designed it to showcase the real innovative entrepreneurs who use technology at the heart of their business. And we have such a variety of very interesting people that have come out of engineering and computer science and have done remarkable things with their lives. And today you're going to meet those. Uh, you know, it's been the last, I've been here eight years, going on nine years. And over the last five years, there's been an entrepreneurial spirit that has really driven into the heart of what we do at USD and the Shadi Marco School of Engineering with our, our engineering and computing students. We have so many that are interested in doing creative and innovative things in their lives also and are, and are just in the process of learning that. So we give them an opportunity through our entrepreneurship program we also call that our ETAC program, where these students can get guidance and mentorship from entrepreneurial leaders, some who have been our former students, but others in, in industry and creative people who have come together to help us. Well, today, we are so delighted to host a 2006 alumnus, Baxter Box, and his wife, Amber Vens Box, to share with you an incredible innovation story. Baxter and Amber are the founders of rewardstyle.com, a global online platform that pioneered the idea of monetizing influencer marketing. Can you imagine an electrical engineer and his wife doing influencer marketing? Well, you'll understand why and how the Foundation of Engineering actually helped this with some other creative influence from Amber. Um, so reward style, features influencers from just about every category that you can think of. When we went there, we saw things from fashion, which are maybe more traditional, but to um, them acquiring computer science and hundreds of employees working on travel, on design of interior, on baby products, you name it. They were into almost everything. In fact, I think, Baxter, I think you told me that pretty soon the runways were gonna go away just because of reward styles. Now, maybe I just, just heard that in my head and, and, it, and it resonated. When you go to their headquarters in Dallas, Texas, um, you're, when we went there a, a couple of years ago, and if you went there, um, you'd think that you fell into a movie set. You walk into this building, it's multiple stories in this high rise. Um, it's a great area with millennials, millennial workspace. Um, but everything was glass and it was beautiful. Um, by the way, there were two high-end open bars that I became interested in and wasn't able to actually imbibe because I was on something, but ping pong tables, pool tables, 
um, motifs everywhere, cafes, snacks, an incredible working environment. Everyone was young, not a lot younger than I am at least, and so I remember that. Fashion books, glossary photographs, you felt like it was a place that you wouldn't actually expect to find an electrical engineer. But as Baxter himself might tell you, he didn't know that much about fashion in this world before he launched Reward Style, but Amber, his better half did, and that's what bringing two interesting people together has done. So between the two of them, they have built this very innovative company. And I think that you're going to find that Baxter has maintained his USD values all along the way. So enough of me. Please join me in welcoming Baxter and Amber to share their incredible story. And thank you. Guys, by the way, that was probably the best introduction. Thank you, Dean. Like, amazing. Uh, couldn't do it any better. We're very excited to be with you today. So good afternoon. My name is Baxter Box. I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO and chairman of Reward Style and like to know it. Um, this is my wife, Amber Vince Box. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about our background today. Um, we're going to give you our story of our kind of the evolution of our company. And then I'm, we're going to end with both talking through some of the key learnings we've learned over the last 10 years and then open it up to questions. But before we jump into that, we thought a video may give more texture to our business uh, and help as we, we tell our story. So we'll jump into that right now. In 2011, Reward Style was barely more than an idea. It was a dream of how do we help lifestyle influencers like myself and brands monetize this new digital space so they can support themselves and their families. Over the last eight years, we've been busy creating innovative technology. We have invested in business intelligence to drive strategy in our consulting. We've grown brand content partnerships and taken on this entirely new challenge of consumer distribution in the complex mobile world by investing in like to know it to bring consumers directly to your doorstep. Together, we have pioneered a new industry from Shanghai to LA and Berlin to Sao Paulo, you, the reward style influencers, have grown into an incredible, strong, thriving community of entrepreneurs sharing incredible fashion, interior design, beauty finds, humorous life moments, and inspiring adventures. We are so proud of where you've been and what you've accomplished, and we know this is just the beginning. As a community of influencers, brands, and consumers, we're revolutionizing retail and reinventing creative entrepreneurship. Okay, can you guys see our screen still? Just want to make sure. Awesome. Yeah. Well, again, my name is Baxter Box. I, I guess as a way of a background, a very brief background, uh, I'm from Dallas, Texas, and uh, went to school at University of San Diego. So I'm a very, very, you know, uh, proud Torero. Um, graduated in 2006 with a with a, a sorry, an engineering electrical engineering degree and math degree. Um, my time at USD was just absolutely incredible. We have four young kids. Uh, I wish it was easier to travel. Obviously, COVID makes that tough because we would be on campus a lot more than we're able to today. But what I learned at USD from an engineering pers perspective, as well as cultural perspective, helped me a ton, which we'll talk a little bit, a little bit more about. Um, I would, if I was to be very specific at USD, um, I learned a lot about how to build innovation into whatever I was doing. And that was very instrumental in uh, building out our business over the last 10 years. Uh, after USD, I went into uh, the medical device world where I was a research and development engineer, which you're probably like, how did you get to, to this point? I'll walk you through that a little bit. Um, after a couple of years of building medical devices, I moved to the dark side of finance and worked for a hedge fund here in Dallas, where I was investing in technology companies, uh, both private and public. And I quickly realized that it was great to, to meet entrepreneurs and invest in those companies. But what I really missed was building products. Again, I think it, it comes back to, that's just sort of my DNA, which is why I went to obviously engineering school. And so I, I met Amber about that time and I'll let her tell you her side of the story, um, but, we started dating and um, 
about that time, I went back to business school and out of business school is when we started Reward Style. So I'll let Amber kind of talk about her background and we'll go from there. So growing up, I always knew I wanted to be in the fashion industry. I just didn't know where. I didn't know if I wanted to be a designer or in PR or in styling or wholesaling or have a store. Um, so I tried it all. And when Baxter and I met, um, I was actually doing personal shopping. And what that meant was I had relationships that I personally built with stores in Dallas, both big box and boutique stores. And they would pay me a commission on sales um, that I brought to them. So I would take their clothing, their products into customers' homes. And then whatever I sold to them, I would get a commission on. And I was able to then um, essentially in 2010, start a blog where I was documenting that whole process. And at the time, there wasn't a way to make money online, but that's what I loved doing was actually, you know, creating um, a place where all of my customers every single day could come and shop for my content. And so Baxter and I were dating at the time um, and decided to launch a platform that would enable me to actually continue on with this business of blogging, you know, moving my traditional offline business now online um, and getting paid for the store, the, the sales that I was driving to e-commerce um, sites. And so today, the platform that we've built actually empowers over 100,000 creators worldwide. Um, a, a source of pride for us is that 100 of those creators have actually earned more than $1 million through the reward style platform. So when you think about scale and democratizing media and letting people of all kinds all around the world into this exclusive fashion industry, the reward style platform has done that. On the, on the retail side, we'll jump into a little bit more about that later, but there's 5,000 brands that are now integrated into our platform, and we sold them one by one by one, teaching them about what a blogger was, why they should work with them, um, and how was the best way to value their work. And today, our influencers drive actually, last year, is $2.5 billion in retail sales to these 5,000 brands. When you think about the reward style platform today, we um, you know, are analogous to other industries in, in the way that you think of what has Airbnb done for hospitality? So it's, you know, reward stuff from the outside looking in can seem very complicated, but essentially what we did was realize that there was something happening in the environment that had value, but no one had quantified. Much the same way on Airbnb, you might have an extra bedroom in your house, but you're not gonna put it on Craigslist. So what we did was actually create a technology platform that offered these independent content creators immediate brand relationships. They were paying brand relationships starting as far back as 2011. Innovative technology that allowed them to create content and publish in a way that was easily shoppable for their audience, regardless of what platform they put it on, whether it was Facebook or Twitter or blogs. And then fast forward to today, all the different platforms that they're on. We offer them growth consulting. Um, so many of our creators come to us with creative skill sets, less business skill sets. And so we're able to help them understand what it means to invest in their own business and how they should think about it. Um, and then finally, we've actually added our own consumer shopping app and sort of bringing distribution um, to them as, you know, as well as them um, bringing it through their own channels like their blog and social media. So when you think about what an influencer is like today, this influencer is creating unique original content. They're putting it across all sorts of different platforms, depending on what type of content and which, which formats are best for them. But it's all central to this, um, this, this individual. Um, and so the, the types of content they're putting out are gonna be unique to each platform. You think about the intent of the customer that shows up at Pinterest or the intent of the customer that shows up at Instagram or the intent of the customer that shows up at the Like to Know It shopping app. They're creating unique content and then distributing it into these channels based on what those customers come there to do. So this is just some of our content in action. One of the great things about, you know, really democratizing media is that there's something for everyone. You know, when I grew up, there weren't a lot of, you know, pale redhead girls from Dallas, Texas with four kids that I'd find in the middle of Vogue magazine. You know, there's a couple of media houses. Um, so a handful of people who got to be editors, a handful of models that got to model for those magazines. And if you didn't fit into that, then you know it was up to your own creativity. Today, I can actually go and find creators that are much like myself and many of them um, and they can act as my guide or my, my best friend or kind of an aspirational figure that has so many similarities to me, but is, is um, giving me access and um, solving some of the problems for me around the trends that I'm dressing myself in or my home or my children. Um, and so I just wanted to show you guys here some of the different platforms and different types of creators and what are actually our clients look like in the wild. 
Okay, let's talk about brands. So if you if you think about our business, it's a bit complicated, but to break it down, <clears throat> everything really starts with the influencer, and that's one of the sides of our marketplace. Then there are consumers, which we'll talk more about in a minute, and then there are the brands. The brands are very critical uh, in our ecosystem in terms of they have specific objectives. And by the way, those objectives haven't really changed over time. They have just uh, had more, they have now have more tools. And so if you think of a traditional retail uh, partner of ours, you know, whether it's a, you know, a Nordstrom as an example, they started as a bricks and mortar retailer that needed to move online. And once they were online, they had certain limited tools. Well, this is another tool for them, meaning reward style and like to know it, to do what they really want to do online, which is drive a lot of branding and awareness and sales ultimately. That's really what they care about and why they're investing. So as Amber said, we, we have one by one onboarded brands across the world um, so that they can authentically communicate to consumers. Because another thing that we realized is, as we were building the business, the reason why consumers uh, or influencers resonated so much with consumers is that consumers really don't trust brands to deliver their own message, which is interesting, right? If you think about it, consumers don't trust the media as much or brands as they may have 20 years ago. And so now consumers are looking to other people who are authentically talking about products, um, which is a big challenge for brands. And now also increasingly those consumers and influencers uh, are spending more time in social mobile oriented channels like Instagram, TikTok, which also makes it very difficult to be a brand that's trying to distribute their message in the, into those channels. So how do they do that? Well, they, they work with us as basically a platform to contact and engage with a distributed sales force and do so with really high intelligence. When I say intelligence, it's, you know, a brand needs to know which influencers should be actually talking about them and in which channels and what should their that kind of return on an investment look like uh, over time. And so we help lots of brands. And interestingly enough, you know, so for some of the biggest brands in the world, we're anywhere, anywhere from 30 to 75% of their mobile referral traffic, sometimes 20, 30, 40% of their total, the total sales being driven to them online. So we've become very, very powerful, uh, particularly for fashion, beauty, home, and kind of the lifestyle categories. Um, so that's kind of a highlight of one of the three sides of our, our three-sided marketplace. For our brand partners, you know, again, we are a, a technology platform. So part of the intelligence we provide them is a dashboard where they can see really what's happening with their influencer engagements. So if they have certain objectives, they can see that in a dashboard, how, you know, how campaigns, a lot of what we do is um, influencers basically engage with brands for engagements that look more like a campaign over time. Um, so, you know, a brand may come to us and say, hey, we have $5 million and we have certain marketing objectives and we would like for you to help us hit that. Well, that's all being run through a platform where they can actually find cast influencers that are right for them, leveraging our rich data and our relationships, and then over time, see how it's performing. So this is just kind of a view of what that dashboard looks like for our brands. What you're seeing here is really the life of our company and some, some of the major hurdles uh, that we've hit. Uh, we started the company in 2011. This is our 10th year, which is both strange and awesome. Uh, when I think about it, it feels like it's been in some ways a year, but it also feels like it's been a hundred years. So uh, when you're running a company, it makes it's time is really difficult. But just as a quick snapshot, I think what this illustrates or what you should take away from it is we moved internationally really quickly. Our influencers were, you know, obviously based in lots of countries. So we needed to support a lot of our influencers in terms of allowing them to talk about any brand they want to and actually uh, be able to monetize that. And so we, we opened our first office in London uh, in 2012. And then we quickly moved into uh, mainland China, uh, Brazil, actually more recently Germany, and we're looking to move into other countries. But the great thing about having a technology platform is you, can, you don't have to physically be in every market that you're operating in. Today, we have about 125,000 influencers in over 190 countries. And so we don't obviously need to be in every country, which is great. Uh, another thing Amber kind of mentioned and we'll talk more about is we moved from at the beginning being a two-sided business to business marketplace to actually extending to a third side of our marketplace with the launch of our app 
uh, like to know it app or our consumer experience that really is the first truly contextual shopping channel powered by influencers. What I mean by that is today or prior to like to know it, if you wanted to uh, search say on Google or Pinterest or anywhere for say a category, like here's a good example. You know, I have a wedding coming up and I would like to know what to wear to a wedding. You know, go try to search that in Google. It's really hard because all you see is thumbnails of products. Um, similarly on most of the other channels, but like to know was the first to actually allow a consumer to search for a category or a product and actually see results in the context of real people's lives. So they can actually see content from real humans showing you all the uh, products that are featured in their recommendation contextually, which has been extremely powerful and has driven uh, a, a large amount of performance, I guess, or sales to our brand partners. Um, like I said, we launched, that, we launched that in 2017, the app. And another thing I guess to take away is it took a very long time to hit our first billion dollars in sales that we're driving to our retail partners, I think about five years. And then we started to see sort of this, you know, nonlinear growth in a big way where it took, you know, very much less time to hit the second, third, fourth. And actually, excitingly, in January of this year, we hit the $8 billion in cumulative sales driven to our brands. Like Amber said earlier, we drove last year a total two and a half billion dollars to our retail partners and it's growing very quickly. Like to know it being the largest of those channels. And we say when we say channel, that means across blog, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, all the channels. Like to know it's actually the largest. We drove about a, uh, north of a billion dollars just through like to know it. Um, so any other things you want to highlight on here? I feel like Amber's itching to jump in. <laughs> Got to keep us on track. just a quick taste of what that app looks like for those of you who don't have it downloaded yet. If you don't, go check it out, App Store, Google Play, um, highly rated shopping app. And you know what Baxter is talking about across all these platforms where our influencers are, are driving um, you know, commerce. Something that has really stood out lately is that while, you know, while we were in a period of consolidation, we're really moving back into an era of fragmentation and people are using different apps to do very specific jobs for them. So I think about just in the course of today, I've already ordered our dinner on one app. I've paid my assistant on another app. Um, of course, I'm emailing through one. I'm checking our bank through another. I'm shopping on like to know it. So all of my different apps do very different jobs for me. In much the same way that I go to Pinterest to dream about my you know, son's fifth birthday party and what that's going to look like. Um, I'm, you know, and I'm going to Instagram to see what's the news on Harry and Megan. I'm also going to like to know it to just specifically go shopping. Everything now today has its specific use case. And what we see is that consumers love using like to know it to go shopping. And so when you think about what does this mean for our influencers, it's the new blog. Over 90% of our influencers that apply to reward style today do not have a blog and we don't see them reverse back into it. This is something that you know they're having to buy a URL, hire a developer, maintain this asset that doesn't have any sort of virality built in, and you're fighting for every piece of traffic. And so today, their like to know it profile is a new platform for them where they're um, servicing the, the customer who comes to shop and really acting as their guide. So here's just a few screens from that app so you can kind of understand what's happening there. Today, you know, there's over 8 million original shoppable pieces of content. We see our user base continues to explode in this app and we're continuing to add more and more features that make it the best and easiest place to go shopping. I wanna pass it back to Bax for a few key learnings over this time. Well, so as you would imagine, we learned a lot of things over the last 10 years. And so it's tough to sort of distill that down into three items, but I'll try. Uh, and then we'll also talk, cause we, we heard there were some questions around what is it like to work with a partner or a spouse? And so maybe we'll hit that question in a second as well. So what are the things we learned? Number one, you know, I found that you really have to find your sweet spot. And that means really what is your intersection of what you're really, really passionate about personally? And what are you really, really good at on the cross section? And so, you know, I just thinking about my career over time, I may have been interested in something, but not extremely passionate or, you know, been really good at it, but, uh, you know, not really wanting to do it as a full-time gig. Um, 
never thought I was going to be doing this. I'll be honest, but, you know, found my sweet spot and I love building products. I love applying innovation to solve really important challenges. And I love, uh, you know, basically building platforms on the internet and Amber, you know, I really have zero interest in fashion, but, or beauty, or obviously that's not relevant to me near as much. Um, but I love, which we'll talk about in a second. I love working with customers to understand their needs. So for you, I guess what I would say is it's challenging to find your sweet spot. And it's not just about what you're doing career-wise or what you're building. If you want to start a company, what you're building, it's also thinking about how to find your sweet spot in the team. So for us internally, we have lots of different people. What I found is I really work well in a certain area. For me, it's thinking about the vision of the company, the product strategy specifically to execute against that vision. And then I don't do the other things, right? I, I compliment myself with people that are much smarter than me to do all those other things, which allows me to wake up every day and be excited about what, I, what I'm doing that day. And also feel like everyone else that's on my team is really going to um, do, again, do their job much better than I would have. So number one, find your sweet spot. Number two, um, another thing we've learned is that and I think we, in some ways, got this right, not because we were smart, certainly not. Um, and it was because when we started the company, we, we were friends with our clients. You know, they were peers of Amber's. We were best friends with them. They happen to be the biggest influencers today. But we really led with kind of a servant leadership mentality, which was sitting down with these influencers and saying, what are your problems? What are your needs? And really understanding and serving them. Um, and then as we were building the business, we also, as we were building the team, thought about, okay, if I was coming into the company as a junior team member, how could, you know, how would I feel really valued? And so for us, the way that we think about it is how do we serve even the most junior team members so that they feel like even at the very top at our level, that we very much value them and that we are doing everything to invest in them and serve them physically directly. Uh, and so number two, what we've learned is when you have a servant mindset, both with, from a customer perspective, as well as internally, you really can build a very special company. And we, we believe we have, um, not because again, uh, if anything necessary that we were smart about, it's just, we knew that we needed to take care of our customers and take care of our team members. Um, so this is something absolutely very applicable in your life, whether it's professional or otherwise. And then number three just enjoy the ride. Um, when we think about the experiences we had over the last 10 years, obviously you feel like you're either coming out of a storm or you're going into it. You know, it's really messy building a company and they call it kind of the messy middle when you're starting the company, kind of going through the process of building the team and trying to build products, whatever that is and delivering to customers. But we, when I look back, there were key moments that we didn't celebrate at the level we could have, uh, whether it was, hey, you know, we're flying all over the world. And yes, it was exhausting, but we were also to be, we were able to meet people and go uh, to incredible places. And instead of, you know, celebrating those moments that I think the level we could have, we were just, you know, we allowed ourselves to be frustrated and, and exhausted. Um, and it's not just about travel. It was about key moments, hiring people. Um, working well collaboratively with team members, hitting milestones. So I guess the third learning was, as I look back over 10 years, is really try to enjoy the, the, the ride, whether it's in the troughs, you know, uh, you know, basically if it's the lows or the highs, um, there's something to kind of piece out of that and say, hey, actually, this is pretty amazing. We're doing something we love. Again, we're in our sweet spot. Yes, maybe things are not going so well, but this is something actually to celebrate because it's really fun what we're doing. Um, so perspective is very important. So those are the kind of three high level learnings. And maybe I'll just really quickly end before questions with another, you know, a lot of, we've learned a lot over the 10 years about working with, you know, in our case, it's a spouse. Uh, when we started the company, we were dating, which brings its own interesting uh, aspects to building a business together. Um, we learned a lot about boundaries. <laughs> For us, that was, that was the learning. And I'll let Amber talk because I've talked a lot, but uh, in the early days, we we're sitting at a desk together on phone calls, you know, and I, you know, critique her phone calls and she'd critique my phone calls. And then we'd go home and then it'd be like, hey, uh, let's talk about work at 10 o'clock at night. And that became really challenging. And so for us to be successful, we realized that we had to set up boundaries 
um, where we knew that we were just not going to pick up the phone. We're not going to talk about work. Um, so anyway, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah. Um, well, even jumping back to your last one of enjoy the ride, I, there was a time of particular frustration where I was talking with another entrepreneur peer and he said to me, he was like, Amber, what you need to understand is that the happiness quotient is actually your expectations minus reality. And what you control in this are your expectations. And one of the things that Baxter mentioned was not kind of celebrating along the way or realizing even just the opportunities that we were given, even if things didn't work out well for us. And so, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're always thinking to that like end, like what's that finale? And people are always asking you what's it, even your parents are like, so you're going to sell the company is somebody going to like buy that you're going to go public. Like what's the thing. And people ask you, you're one, you're two, you're five, you're seven, you're 10. And so you think that you're aligning to that expectation of I've missed if that's not my outcome. And that hasn't been the way that, um, you know, that we've built the company. And I, I actually found that that moment being a huge realization for me of my expectations were just off. And that's the, the thing that I can control that will then ultimately make me um, a happier entrepreneur. And then with what Baxter said, I think the main thing about working together is actually just those lanes, like very specific lanes where he does one thing in the business, I do another thing. And um, I found that, you know, on the weekends that we would, you know, you're constantly thinking of ideas and things that you want to critique or ask each other. And we started putting something in place where if you wanted to talk about that thing, you just need to put a calendar invite for the following week on the person's calendar. And what I found actually was that a lot of times you through your own, you know, kind of sorting it out, no, didn't need to have that meeting anymore, or you'd had time to form more thought around it. So it was more meaningful time spent together. And just simply by putting that practice in place, it allowed us to actually get away and kind of exhale on our weekends. So with that, um, we can jump into some questions. Sure awesome. Cool. So um, I think we can all relate when uh, Baxter says that your first billion is always the hardest, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we do have um, one question in the chat. Do your influencers ever express in interest in creating their own products? Absolutely. And I think that's, that's one of the interesting things. We have a podcast out. If you'll reach, listen to the episode um, from Rachel Parcell, the person who asked this question, is that we created reward style analytics very early. And Rachel tells the story about how she, through her analytics, was able to see, wow, I sell this category of products at this price point phenomenally well. In fact, I sell them at you know X dollars per year. And so I can actually then self-fund my own line, creating that quality at that price point in that category and, and have a, a pretty um, solid understanding of like what the success rate would look like within that. Rach was one of our first stories. And so she tells more about it on the podcast. Um, but you know, we, we continue to see our influencers be interested in this. And what's interesting is they start out on one side of our ecosystem as an influencer, and then they come back in on the other side as well as they extend their brands on the other side, whether that's Studio McGee with the line with Target or Rach Parcell or her sister with IVL, who have then come back in as reward style um, advertisers and are actually now commissioning their peers to talk about their products as well. Awesome. Good question. Yeah. Good intuition. <laughs> Okay, so somebody says here that they're very interested in learning how you built your company culture. Hmm. Very intentionally, <laughs> honestly. Um, it, it started out in the beginning of, of outlining and identifying just the key values of our organization. And while we intrinsically knew as entrepreneurs why we were here in our mission, and that was it, it was to empower influencers to be as economically successful as possible. With every new person you hire, they get farther and farther away of knowing you and knowing why you started this thing. And they didn't see those early days. And so it became really important for us. Actually, I think it was like two years into the company to actually say, hey, guys, here is our mission. This is why we're all here. These are the things that we find really, really valuable. It's fun, but it's also humility and it's also grit and it's also hustle. Um, and so we kind of outlined that in a, in a playbook for the team and we walked them all through that. But it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to live it. And so when we talk, you know, Baxter talks about kind of a servant mindset um, and very much kind of caring for our people, which by the way is um, really important when you think about the happiness of your clients then down the line. Um, you know, it was essentially treating other people as we wanted to be treated. We wanted like, we wanted not only to have like food in the office, which was important to both of us, but have like really good food in the office that made people really excited to like go get the great cheese and not just like some cheap whatever that, you know, just to fill some shelves. These things sound simple, but like people really, you know, when we showed up with keto chocolate, people are like, this is amazing. Like this is from the office. And so there are little things that you can do to win. Um, we also created like almost reward style holidays, I'll call them. So one of the first things, and this was actually Baxter's doing, 
um, was in, in Texas, where we started, the state fair is a really big deal. And so starting our first year, we took our entire team, which year one was two people, um, to the state fair and took the whole day off and gave everybody tickets to go enjoy. And now today they come, they bring your, their family. We have this um, you know, scavenger hunt that's part of it, but everybody knows every year they get that kind of day off. Um, there's other things that we do around competitions and newsletters and used to it, like, for example, in Thanksgiving, it would be in the office, we'd have a competition of every, it would be this huge kind of family style, you know, meal, everyone would bring something into be a competition of who made the best dessert and the best meat and the best everything else. Of course, this year that didn't happen. So what we did actually was we um, hired a chef to come in, do a Zoom call with our entire team, and we shipped the food boxes to their house. So everybody had all the ingredients and everything there and could log on and actually create with us. So interestingly, the pandemic, um, we've actually rated better in our internal scoring as far as culture with pandemic. I think it's because we've had to even further focus on the things you know, that we're doing, but it's, you know, it's, it's ongoing education. It's really just showing people that, that you care and, and demonstrating that whether you know, it's the, the food baskets or kind of the fun and games or the way that you even onboard people will be my last comment is I think like it's super critical. I think when it, you come from the consulting world, you hear that a lot of like, you know, your interns end up being the best people because they were onboarded in such a, you know, an organized and corporate way. And for us, like when we're hiring, you know, we're sending branded cookies and drinks. If someone has said they love tequila, we're like, you know, we send in their offer and we send that type of tequila that we have the conversation with on the phone call. Like you're picking up of the things that people say are important to them and then leaning into those things, starting from day one, um, just showing them that you hear them, you value them and that um, they're an important part of the family. So, so I have I have a quick follow-up, Amber. Was it difficult to make the technology developers understand your customers? You know, so it, a couple of answers to that. Um, so our developers, I would say actually still today don't interface with, with that customer group. And so backing that up then, then to the product team, um, you know, our product team has gotten better and better about understanding the customer and, you know, doing more kind of studies and more testing around that. Um, and then that's probably the biggest value that I bring to the organization is, is just actually being our own customer and, um, and pinpointing, you know, the, the friction points and, and the opportunities. So for example, that when the team will launch something and they'll say, okay, well, that new feature is out. And I'm like, well, it's not out actually, because I use it. And there's this one thing that's like, you know, stopping me that we just got wrong. So let's go back to the drawing board. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whereas you know, Baxter comes with a whole different set of, of value to the organization, even today, um, as we as we move forward, I think it's really important that you have someone who is your customer in the organization. Otherwise, you don't have a competitive advantage against anyone else because anyone can go out and do research and ask bloggers how they feel about things and try and build a product that suits their needs. But, you know, um, being so intimate in actually having an influencer business myself, I think has been an advantage, but you can compare that to any industry, whether it's oil and gas or airlines or, you know, I don't know, phone cases. So. No. So, so Jeff Tays asked the question that I was uh, wondering is, um, are you hiring? Because uh, when you said, you know, you're sending your, your, uh, your employees tequila and cookies, that's not <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, So there was a question, a, a very specific question. They, uh, people wanted to know the name of the podcast that you referenced. Yes. So it's called um, Like to Know It Influencer Radio. And I'm the host. I think there's, we did several seasons of it. There's probably 30 to 50 episodes there. Um, and Rachel Parcell was the specific episode that I referenced about the influencer who created a product line. And she kind of talks through that entire process. Um, and, and here's a, a good question. Um, what were your biggest growth challenges and how did you manage those? So many. We got so many things wrong. I will tell you that and still do to this day. <laughs> um, I, I think one thing that's been the, the hardest thing for us just to be completely candid is having like in our minds an understanding of what we're trying to achieve vision wise. And what's typically been a bottleneck for us or difficulty is getting people A, to understand what we're trying to achieve, whether it's engineers or it's, you know, like really trying to tangibly illustrate that and really so that's one challenge the second challenge is really hiring people that have skills in those areas right because right now i mean good for engineers by the way it's amazing like there's so many options you sort of can do whatever you want and so for us like it's gotten easier because we brought on incredibly talented senior leaders 
that have amazing networks of people. But in the early days, we didn't have that. We didn't have the capital to hire like the best people in every area. Mm -hmm. And so talent has been our limitation, I would say, uh, to this point. So, you know, it's certainly a buyer's market or I don't know what you want to call it, what side of it in terms of if you're an engineer or a designer or somebody in that space, seller's market, yeah, that's probably a better way of saying it, then you, you are in a really good position, but there are also a lot of bad companies out there. So you have to kind of be careful. Um, uh, they kind of treat you as just sort of a cog in the, in the machine. Um, so I, I would say, in, you know, getting product and engineering talent that have experience, like that's really challenging. Um, what, what, what else would you say? Like that, that's kind of the execution has been the challenge for, for us or like early days, especially. It's, it's all around talent and just knowing good talent. And I think that's one of the things that I'm so appreciative of our experience to this point and being able to get to this point is I feel like I'm only now seeing world-class talent that I, that I work with every day that I'm in meetings with every day. And until you've known it it's, and experienced it, um, it's hard to even identify. So whenever we decided to stop manage everyone directly, which by the way, was not that long ago, it was like three years ago. Um, we hired uh, 10 VPs within a 10, within a year period. Um, the first three were total mishires. And after close to two years, I think we finally realized that and, and let them go and kind of started fresh. And, um, you know, we, we just realized that you know, not only is it hard to get great people interested in your organization, but a lot of times you don't know what you're looking for because you've never even seen it before. Um, and so that was a, that was one of the things. And then something else I actually went back to put in the key findings that we ultimately didn't, but that like money doesn't solve a lot of your problems. So I think as an entrepreneur, you're, we're also oriented towards like raising money, got to raise money. Like I think, you know, because TechCrunch is fueled off of people who raise money and that's the stories that they write, you wake up every day thinking that that's a key to your success. And what I would say is pouring money on a fire that's burning money is, is not, you know, a, gr a great thing. You need to be able to digest it appropriately. And, um, you know, lucky for us, I would say it was challenging for us to raise money because when we did, um, the word blogger was a pejorative term. Nobody really understood why um, this guy was bringing his wife from Dallas, Texas to tell about her blog. And so we had a really, you know, a huge challenge in the, in the very beginning. I think ultimately that was great for us because I think we would have lit money on fire, but we were so disappointed for so long that we weren't able to really um, capitalize the business in a bigger way because people wouldn't listen to our story. So even with other projects that we have since either funded or involved in, um, I think sometimes, you know, working on a smaller budget actually sharpens you as an entrepreneur and, and in a weird way enables the silver lining is that it forces like fierce prioritization and, and, and uh, focus within your business. Awesome. So here's a question from a current student for you, Baxter. Um, how was your transition from engineering into business? Um, this student is considering getting an MBA and is wondering if you think getting an MBA is worth the time and money. <laughs> so current student, or did you say current student? It looks, student? Like, it looks like a current student. Okay. Um, yeah, really interesting question. Actually, I get it a lot. I would say that... One thing that's important when you're thinking about, so the transition is actually smoother than you would think, but there's a lot you don't know. Um, and so be open-minded in that arena. Um, you have a massive advantage in terms of understanding intricately how things can work, right? Well, it, you, that's one thing you'll understand when you go into the world is not a lot of people have like component building mentality, like how to build something from scratch really hard. A lot of people don't get that. Um, so big advantage there. The, the thing that you'll have to complement it with is, you know, for me, that's why I went back to business school was finance, accounting, like valuing companies, also the strategy and entrepreneurship, which is basically when you're running a business, a lot of what you have to do is think about three steps ahead because technology particularly is very comp competitive. And so if you're not thinking three steps ahead all the time, somebody's going to copy you really quickly and, and potentially disrupt you, right? And that's, you know, that's what you're doing and then they do it to you. So you have to be very careful. I would say though, that just a couple, this is my perspective, but I, I'm glad I waited to go back to business school until I had, I think I had like six, seven years of experience. They typically recommend you have a certain amount of, you know, basic experience out of school. And it, because you really need to know what you want to do before you go to business school. Yeah. Um, I, I had people that went to business school and they sort of like, I don't know, I, I'm hoping business school will tell me. And those people probably got the least out of business school because they didn't have a direction um, because you have to start making choices once you go to business school as to, you know, what are you going to study? Um, 
Who are you going to start aligning yourself with out as you leave business school? So whether you're starting a company or you want to go work in a you know corporation and you, you kind of generally know, that's good. But they also, business schools, really want you to have at least three to five years experience out in the world. Um, and it's a good time, again, just to get to know what, find your sweet spot to some extent. You'll see some deficiencies. And then you, if you need to complement with business school, do it. I will say, though, I have a lot of friends that did not go to business school. And I think I have certain, like I ran our, as an example, it's probably a long-winded answer, sorry. Um, I ran our finances for the first like five years. So I ran our payroll, accounting, like all these things that if I didn't go back to business school would have been very tough. I sat with investors and did valuation, you know, I, you know, uh, did all the negotiations on that side because in a small company, you sort of have to do lots of different things and that's highly valuable. Um, so long winded answer of saying I would work <laughs> for a while if you can and try to test different things. That's one thing I regret. Like I probably should have done more, did more scope of things. Before I went to business school, before I started a company, I think it would have been helpful. Um, business school, I thought was valuable. Some people don't see it as, as valuable. It just depends on the direction you want to go. Fantastic answer. I mean, the combination of engineering and business is powerful. I think however you get there, um, we've seen that it's a very powerful uh, combination. I think we have time for one last question before we're at the end of our time. Um, what upcoming trends in the business side of the influencer industry do you see happening that you're excited about? You know, I think last year, I believe it was that Webster's actually added influencer to the dictionary. <laughs> so all of the things we presented today are probably like super obvious to you guys are like, oh yeah, social commerce. Oh yeah, influencers, like this is trite. And what I would say is like, it's only just now arrived. These brands are truly only in the last year now saying I have an influencer budget or influencer is my strategy period. And I'm going public with that strategy. You look at like a, a Revolve, for example, that did that. Um, and so I think what's exciting for us is that people are on board and we've already laid all the groundwork and been and then been building this muscle over time. So now that brands come to us and say, hey, I don't want to just dabble with 500 influencers. Let's let's start doing campaigns this month with 1400. We're like, let's go. And it's in the infrastructure is built um, and we're, we're ready to charge for it. So I think for us, this is like it's just now becoming fun in so many ways because people like really want to use the things um, that we've we built for them. It's exciting both for us and for our engineers, for example, to see just the volume of people that are running through the pipes that they build. Yeah, that's a really good point. The, the pace of our development, which again, if you're an engineer in this group, you know, there's nothing more fun than seeing things ship, like particularly software, but even if it's a hardware product, like getting it in front of people and getting feedback. And so for us, the cycle or the latency of that, getting things to market has shrunk so much because we've gotten highly skilled people that know how to build products really quickly and build the right products and get them to market has been really fun to see. And so some ways it's sort of like watching our baby. And for a long time, we were like holding the baby swimming upstream for like a long time. And now like the stream switched and now we're, you know, the streams that are back, right. And we're floating down the river. So it feels really good, which is really fun for everybody. It's an amazing story. I think this is the third time I've heard you guys talk about this journey and I learned something every time. It's fascinating. Congratulations on all your hard work and your successes. It's wonderful. And when COVID is over, we really want you to come to campus. We want to take you out for a celebratory lunch and have people pepper you with more questions. Um, but in the meantime, please, everybody just join me in thanking um, Baxter and Amber. It was a fantastic uh, presentation, learned a lot. And we will be hosting another Ignite Innovation event sometime in the fall. We don't have the date for that yet, but we'll let you know as soon as we can. And thank you again so much, Baxter and Amber. Guys, thank you so much for your time. You. I appreciate it. Thank you, USD, everybody. Lisa, thank be you. Be well, so you guys. Be well. Be safe, guys. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, Dean.